legend, mentor to mentors, and the highest paid marketing consultant in the world. He's the go-to guy now. And I gotta say, there's if you think of most of the marketing consultants that you probably don't have the name of, They've all been influenced by Jay. I probably wouldn't be here without my mentor, Jay Abraham. Through you know his teachings and what he's done for me, he's taught me how to position myself in very unique positions. What is my unique offering, as well as the ability to communicate. Jay Abraham has significantly increased the bottom line of over 10,000 clients and over 400 industries worldwide. Jay has had a tremendous influence on my business. Not just my business, but really the deep ways in which I think about my students, my readers, my clients, my customers. His books have profoundly influenced my ability to grow Bulletproof, and his personal mentorship and his one-on-one -on -one sessions with me have absolutely changed the game for me and for Bulletproof and for our mission to change the world. Forbes magazine called him the real thing and lists Jay as one of the top five executive coaches in the country. He's also a best-selling author and has been featured in USA Today, The New York Times, Inc., and Success, among many others. Life is a series of mentors, and Jay Abraham is absolutely the best in that area. All right. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be able to interview you again today. And I would love to start out by asking you what inspired you to write a book about business risk mitigation and why is it important to you today? Sure. Well, it's a little bit more than a book on business risk mitigation. It's a book about a whole alternative reality that if anybody who is a business owner, entrepreneur, professional, or ever aspires to be one reads and follows, it will dramatically increase their success ratio. Jesus, I guess you could call it probably by uh, by almost uh, 19 or 20 times more favorable, but it will shorten the timeline for them to gain prosperity and even wealth creation. And so it was really, it was uh, a concept that was introduced to me about three years ago by my co-author, and uh, he has been focused squarely on not starting businesses and not growing businesses strictly through good selling or marketing or, uh, or strategy, but on using acquisition, very astute, very innovative, very, very strategic acquisition to create far larger businesses, far more successful businesses, far greater incomes, for the business owners, far more wealth creation for everybody, every stakeholder. And when I met him, I was very thrilled because he had a, a, a point of view that I had never contemplated. His point of view is why start a business from scratch, aspiring entrepreneurs, pre-startup entrepreneurs, when it has a one in 20 first year success rate on average, there are certain anomalies but on average or when you have oh my glasses are crooked when you have a one in ten five-year success rate why not instead find any of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of businesses that exist all over the United States even millions in some categories if you want to go a little smaller that have already broken through the five-year success rate barrier, but they're tremendously underperforming all they could be, all they could be generating, all the income they could be earning, get control of them with any of 200 different strategies my co-author has that uh, for acquiring them, most require little or no of your own out-of-pocket income, I mean cash, capital. And then I have 97 categories, Sheila, not just ways, but categories some have as many as literally uh, 20 different tactics for blowing up profit and EBITDA for multiplying so dramatically it almost doesn't calculate the bottom line, none of which require any investment or risk. And then over a two or three year period, you should be ready to sell it for a multiple, way, way, a multiple, a markup, a, a 
just a monumentally increased profit well, well, well beyond what you paid. And all along, if you do it right, you're going to get an income stream for yourself or your family that will be outrageous. And then you do it again and again. And if you own a business of your own, why grow it conventionally through good marketing, advertising, selling alone, when you can use acquisition to dramatically expand the size, scope, and profitability, you can buy your competitors, you can buy products, services people buy before, during, after they buy your product. You can even acquire companies selling alternative products that people would buy instead of yours when you get inquiries, inquiries that don't buy, or you get prospects that don't buy, or you get people that buy one of many things they could buy from you and other people are selling the same things. You can also acquire what's called access vehicles, podcasts like this that reach an audience maybe I want for clients, uh, blogs, discussion groups, URLs, even sales forces. So it's a very, very more, uh, it's a much more higher performing, higher uh, income generating much, much greater wealth creating strategy than the one most small and medium sized uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, and aspiring business owners pursue. And when I really understood it and got involved in collaborating with him, I thought that we had the basis of, of uh, introducing a way of thinking, being, doing, and amassing uh, tremendous prosperity and, and wealth for people who really would never on their own ever even get close to that. So in a nutshell, that's a far more protracted answer, but that I hope explains the fact that it's not just mitigating business uh, 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 failure. It is tremendously shifting the odds, elevating the probability of prosperity and wealth creation and giving you a strategy you control instead of being controlled by vagaries of, uh, of business or the market. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And coming from a business background myself, I started my gift store when I was 23 years young, and it was a miracle that I, I stayed in business for 17 years. I went back to school to learn about uh, get a business degree because everybody else had a, a degree and I didn't, although I was doing the work. And the first thing the professor taught me was opportunity cost. And that was when I was like, holy smokes, what stores? And I, I already owned the buildings because I was an investor. I didn't even realize I was making a lot of money with the investing. And so I was able to rent the buildings out. I actually did sell the business as well. And I continued on to consult with the new company. Uh, so we were out selling like the Crabtree and Evelyn stores at the mall. And we had certain things that you had to have rights to be able to sell. So that's what brought me out of that business and on to Tony Robbins events and traveling the world that gave me the chance to do that. And that was where I got to hear you first present at the Business Mastery. So there is a real blessing to a certain time in a business where they really want to sell, where it helps the business as well as the, the business owner wants to get out. And um, so to be able to have somebody come in and buy that business gives them that freedom they're looking for. So what would you say is a good example of what type of business to look for when you want to um, do this process and buy it? Yeah, the, the good news is there's not a single type. It depends on where you are. If you're, uh, if you're a, a small, let's, let's say you had a, uh, a hair salon, okay? And that hair salon had six people operating. You could buy one, two, five other hair salons. But let's say that people that went to your hair salon also had their nails done. You could buy nail salons. And let's say that you're in an area where they go to a lot of events and it's not uh, always sunny. And so they get spray tan. You could buy a spray tan. 
Uh, let's say some of the people have thin air women and they get hair extensions. You could have a hair extension. We have friends that get their eyebrows done every couple of weeks and they're, you know, different, uh, you know, different vanity things. My wife gets, gets uh, facials, uh, heavy duty and non heavy duty at least twice a month. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I mean, all of a sudden, instead of having six uh, stylists working for you that either pay you rent or you get a share of now, all of a sudden with my example, if you could figure how to do it astutely and you could, if you read this book that we came up with, you could have eight or 10. And, and then if you had all this relationship, maybe uh, you have a background in real estate, you get your real estate license. So you build all these referrals for big transactions and on and on and on and on. That makes, that makes sense. So that's really helping all those other businesses that actually may be struggling right now when, when you uh, blend the businesses and work together as a team. It takes the pressure off just one, one particular business. So if eyebrows go out of style all of a sudden, you're not, or hair or whatever it is, then you have something else to fall back on. So I love how you're uh, creating this combination of collaborative businesses. Could you give an example of how that worked in, in real life with a business that you worked with? Well, I mean, I'll give Roland is got more examples because my, my work has always been just working with clients and getting a share of the profit increases. His work has been working with companies and getting a share of the equity for doing this for them. Uh, give you a couple examples close to home there. They have a real estate roll up right now where they've put something like 500 real estate offices together. They're doing about $6 billion and they're going to do about, I think maybe 20% more roll ups and they think they could exit with everybody sharing in a billion dollars plus of uh, acquisition money and still, you know, operate their, their relative, uh, uh, businesses. Uh, he's done it with, uh, he's done it in service businesses. He's done it in manufacturing by acquiring different product services that could be absorbed where you have duplicative error, duplicative functions where you can eliminate benevolently, you take care of somebody or you repurpose them. So you're not cruel, but if somebody has got 20 people needed to do a, a certain business and somebody else has 20 people and neither is fully uh, utilized, the acquirer, you, if you were acquiring it, could either eliminate half of those people because you've already got those services and all that overhead becomes profit. You could repurpose them to other functions. You could eliminate structures that are rent and just bring it to yours. And even if you subleased it and lost a little bit, it's a lot less than paying the full rent. You could redeploy people who are in the operating field to selling. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do. Yes, yes, that, that's very true. That's incredible. And I loved how the book gets into the deal analyzing. So I'm coming from real estate and I always buy to get a 40% profit. And so this explains kind of how to do this profit, find, see a business that might be profitable, but has so much more that they could gain by applying the principles that uh, you and Roland together have shown. So could you um, explain what would be the best way to um, analyze a deal? I know this is probably the most important part. And if you don't follow the instructions and go through all those points, that's where you could lose a lot of money trying to buy a business without looking into the details first. Yeah, sorry about that. First of all, you have to understand uh, the, as you said, the economics, I don't want to get into too much technicality, but I'll just give you a thumbnail. So the first thing is you want to see what kind of multiple the business sells for as it is right now. And a multiple is a, uh, is a percentage uh, above or below a benchmark uh, correlation, either a percentage of the profit it makes or a percentage of the revenue. 
So let's say you are looking at a business that has a market uh, percentage multiple of two times, just to make it easy, profit at a small level. Let's say it's a million dollar business. And at that level, they're worth two times profit. And the profit on the business you're buying is $100,000. So it would have a market value based on the norm of $200,000. But let's say that you find that if you get that business above five million, the multiple goes to four or five or six times. So if you just got it to that level and no more percentage profit, then it would be worth six times multiple, not just two. And the two that and the and the million you bought would not be worth now. 200,000, it would be worth literally 600, $400,000 profit, but you'd be building up the profit and the revenue through acquisition as well. So then you see is, are there out there a lot of either competitive or complementary type product service companies that are not doing as well that you should be able to target? And you start looking at all those things and then you look at different, I call it a kaleidoscopic sort of a, uh, a Rubik's cube of all the ways you could do it. And what I always tell people, it, but it explains to you how you can create wealth almost instantly by doing things like that. And it gives you many, many, many examples. So I don't want to get too deep in it because it can get a little bit, uh, it's very easily explained at when you under, and when you understand it, you get very excited but it's all about two things. It's about taking a business that has a lower multiple and turning it into one that has a much higher one, but at the same time, dramatically multiplying whatever the key um, benchmark factor is. Profitability usually, but sometimes it's revenue if it's a strategic company that would acquire it. But it's always acquiring with the with the, with the goal of exiting in a certain period of time. However, there is a switch on that or a twist. You might be an entrepreneur who's not ready to retire and you haven't begun to exercise your growth, your empire building capabilities and empire building is a relative term. If you have one business right now and you've never really thought of having five or seven uh, different integrated businesses or acquisitions because you never thought it was possible. You thought it was only for the ranks of the Goldman Sachs and the private equity firms and the venture capitalists. When you realize how accessible it is and how easy it is to do and done right, how easy it is to dramatically multiply upside potential and dramatically minimize downside risk and even move risk uh, totally out of your, your life. If you can acquire a business with almost no out of pocket and you can grow the profitability many times over with no investment or risk. And if in doing those two things, you're having a great time, but you are multiplying the asset value, the net worth, the wealth creating capability of that business by orders of magnitude, and you can do it over and over again. That's rather interesting. Uh, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And it, I loved how the book talked about uh, being an acquirepreneur and working above the business. So it's not like you're going to buy this business and run it day to day. And I think that's um, one of the things that if you've had a business and you're coming from running the business and all that, it's a little bit different um, strategy that makes it, that's why you can do five or so many businesses at once because you're uh, above that business in a sense, overseeing it all. So that's very helpful. How, how do you help people learn that different process um, from being involved in the day-to-day -to, -day to being above and, and kind of having all these steps put into place? Well, the whole purpose of the book, by the way, the book is not a light, it's not deep in terms of being difficult to grasp, but it's not light in terms of a lot of books they, uh, that people publish are, frankly, they're just 
uh, teasers trying to get people to buy their products or programs. Roland and I mostly are interested in deal flow. We're interested in finding the needles in the haystack amongst all the people who might buy and read the book, who have businesses large enough that we might be able to collaborate for shares in, you know, in the dramatic upside that we could create. But that's only a small number. So we created this book to be very, very uh, actionable, not just be uh, intellectually stimulating and conceptually exciting, but to motivate people to really want to do it because we know a lot of people uh, don't realize how much more is possible for the rest of their business life. And um, I, I think the book itself is 447 pages. It's got charts, it's got examples, it's got multiple uh, uh, actual clear-cut uh, explanations of how to do the various processes. It's got case studies and probably the most uh, compelling uh, occur encouragement I can give anybody to want to read it is that Tony Robbins wrote a five-page foreword for the book, which is actually very compelling, and he doesn't do things like that lightly. Damon John from Shark Tank wrote a three-page introduction to the book. Uh, a very prominent man in entrepreneurial circles, Gino Wickman, who started an organization called EOS, Entrepreneur's Operating System, and also wrote many books. Uh, the most popular, I think, is called Traction, wrote the preface. Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank is one of many endorsers. There's no book on the market like this, to my knowledge. There's no book that advocates this much more uh, more significant and safe alternative strategy for being a very, very successful and a very prosperous and even wealthy entrepreneur. And I say even wealthy because wealth, Sheila, is a very arbitrary concept. Your idea of wealth and mine and somebody that uh, we were talking about, somebody that maybe has one a hair salon, their idea of wealth at this freeze frame point in time before they were introduced to this discussion might be X. Once they're done with the book, it might be 5X, 10X, 100X, because it's possible. It's very possible. These are methods that have been used at a much more sophisticated level by the private equity firms, the Goldman Sachs, the, you know, all these huge companies that aggregate acquisitions. You can use a variation, a torqued down, much easier, clear, much more simpler and user-friendly version for yourself, no matter what industry you're in, no matter the size of your current business pro uh, practice, you can be, a, a, I mean, if you were thinking of starting a business, even if you have a great idea, why don't you acquire one that serves the same audience? And now you've got, uh, you've, you've acquired a profitable revenue source, but you've also acquired thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of prospects for the startup that you would have had to waste a year or two and lots and lots of capital of your own or investors trying to find. Mm -hmm. That's that a great idea. Now, so who exactly is this book for? Would you say a, a small business, business owner? owner what what would you suggest would be the person that would be uh, or people that would um, really benefit from reading this book? Yeah, I think that's the wrong question. Who wouldn't benefit? <laughs> Anybody that has no latent or or evident entrepreneurial uh, 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 passion flowing in their blood. Anyone who doesn't would not want to read it. Anybody who's in business. Anybody who has a private, uh, a professional practice, anybody who uh, is a, a active or passive investor and is content to get something like, I don't know, 8, 10, 12, 15 percent, 20 percent return would be uh, mind blown by this. Anybody who has the desire to ever become an entrepreneur, anybody who has a uh, a child, probably, uh, you know, above 12, who has any entrepreneurial bet that ever wanted to do anything online, offline, would be 
a benefit. Anybody who ever tried a business and it didn't do well because they tried from scratch and they didn't realize that they only had a 5% uh, factor working for them and they had 95% working against them would be good. Anybody who loves one of the most intellectually, creatively, and and fascinating reads, anybody who admires Tony Robbins and, uh, and trusts him, anybody who admires Shark Tank and has enjoyed it, anybody who has ever been influenced by um, uh, the, the correlation of expertise to uh, increased success and profitability, anybody who's tired of wasting time just watching Netflix or uh, you know, or uh, the equivalent, anybody who's tired of spending hours uh, wasting time on their, uh, you know, on their uh, phone or, or iPad, you know, uh, surfing the internet. I mean, they would all benefit. That makes so much sense. And there was an entire chapter that I got to read about relational capital and strategic alliance. Could you share some examples about that and how that can help? help with this? Sure. Yeah, sure. So the concept in a nutshell is that why go into the cold market, knocking on doors, uh, trying to set up a, a booth at a trade show, running ads on Facebook or television, or nailing into a business or a neighborhood, when in fact, there's always going to be someone else, some other entity, organization, company, person, influencer, who's already spent hard won amounts of time, effort, and frequently money building and establishing the trust, the credibility, and direct access to the same market you want. If you can figure out who they are and convince them that whatever it is you offer, your company, your product service, you are someone and something that brings enormously superior value to people uh, who purchase from you and get them to endorse you, recommend you, promote you, make you their recommended provider, co-brand with you, partner with you, then you can basically achieve in a matter of weeks or months what you couldn't achieve in a matter of years. You can penetrate markets you could never, ever access on your own. You can shorten the sales cycle. Examples, I was in, I'll give you close examples. I was in the newsletter and the gold brokerage business when I started. And I was able to take gold brokers that normally would run ads in the Wall Street Journal or the financial magazines to find investor clients. And I was able to make my client companies, the recommended providers to a bunch of newsletters. And we went from $300,000 to 500 million, a half a billion dollars in two years for almost no out-of-pocket risk. I went into the seminar business when I was a bit younger and I got Tony Robbins and Success Magazine and at the time the largest audio publisher that sold to Audible. And I got um, Entrepreneur, I already said that, and I got Brian Tracy and I got all kinds of people to endorse me and all the seminar people that weren't in business seminars and I did $250 million, again, a quarter billion dollars of seminar and product program sales in two and a half years using a minuscule amount of fixed capital. Uh, uh, I did IC Hot, and when I did IC Hot, it was starting out, and we got a thousand plus radio stations, television stations, publications, newspapers, magazines to promote us and we only paid for the sales generated. We got about $150 million at today's uh, rate of advertising for no cost at all. We just paid for the sales that were generated. It created so much demand. We were originally a mail order product that we for it forced people to go to their uh, groceries, their, their drug stores asking for the product. We were able to then become a 
product sold in all the stores. In two years, it grew so much that this is 40 years ago, we sold it for $60 million. In two years from a standing start, we paid very little for all of this. It was just paid out of results. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me give you a couple of other examples that are cool. Carnival Cruise, when they started out, they were a secondhand, a uh, little funky one boat, uh, one boat uh, cruise line. And that was boat. They were so poor. Very true story because I knew the man that worked there. They only could afford to paint it on one side. They had to bring it in on uh, the painted side wherever they went. So it looked much nicer than it was. It would go out every week half empty. Another friend of mine, uh, actually, same guy, but uh, in a different role, he was able to go to radio TV stations and exchange unsold uh, space on the cruise line for advertising on radio and TV stations. And he was smart enough to get the, the advertising right away, but let people use their credits uh, long, long into the future. And they built it into hundreds of millions of dollars and then billions of dollars. And they used acquisition to acquire five other, I think they have five other cruise lines on a worldwide basis. Um, I can give you on and on stories like that. There are many of them. I mean, the easiest story, anybody that uh, is insured with Allstate, in the beginning, Allstate had almost no clients. Uh, it's Sears, uh, which was for a long time a popular department store, bought Allstate. They decided uh, that rather than have people knock on doors cold, they would let Allstate agents have a booth inside all their stores, and they would let them capitalize on the goodwill that Sears had, because Sears had, a, for many years, a great reputation. When people in, were in Sears buying things, they would go by, go past an agent, and the agent would be uh, there in implied trust because they were inside the Sears store. And they would look at their current insured and find better ways to insure them. And that's how they built a huge audience. Uh, many years ago, speaking of insurance, <coughs> pardon me, Colonial Pen, which a lot of people know the name, is an insurance company. It started out as a group targeted uh, organization that would find associations, unions, uh, big companies. And they were struggling, struggling, struggling because they couldn't get uh, organizations to easily switch over to them. And after about two years of struggling, one of the directors, who was a very clever man, said, okay, if we can't get an organization, let's start our own to endorse us. So they created something that everybody knows of today, AARP, the American Association of Retired People, just so they would have a client. I mean, I've got myriad of examples like that because I've done about a billion dollars of these kind of transactions on a worldwide basis for my clients. But um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, the key is who's already got access to the audience you want. It's not competitive and would be incentivized. Well, I gave it the, probably the best one that everyone laughs about uh, many years ago before the relationships between the United States and China became so strained. I used to do entrepreneurial trainings in China, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Bali, uh, all kinds of countries in Asia and Japan. And one time I was in uh, China and a young man at the end of a training program I did came to the mic and he was frustrated, Sheila, because he said, what do you do if the bank, if you're too small and the bank won't lend you money to grow? And I asked him for details and turned out he was a small, operative word, small, local, operative word, local motorcycle manufacturer in China. Now, only in China, where a city can be 100 million people, could you be a local motorcycle manufacturer. But his dream was to go all over Asia, find a good location, build a manufacturing plant, go all over 10, 20 uh, countries, you know, uh, set up offices, hire salespeople, recruit dealers, sell motorcycles everywhere. And when he told me about it, I said, okay, well, what's your problem? And he got very mad. He goes, I told you the bank won't lend you, lend me money to grow. And I said, you don't need money. All you have to do is go all over Asia, find somebody in a comp, a, not a competitive, but a complementary business 
who has a huge factory, it's not being fully utilized, that has representation in many, many countries with their complementary product or service and would be willing to partner with you. And that was very simple. I gave him about another minute of explanation. 15 months later, I returned to do another round of seminars and this young man came to the mic at the end and was smiling like the Cheshire cat and said, I did what you said, Jay. And I didn't even remember because my whole life when I'm not talking about the book is I'm solving problems like this all over the world for people of all kinds. But he told me what I told him. And I said, what did you do? And he said, I did that. I went all over Asia. When I got to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, KL as they call it, I found Asia's largest lawnmower manufacturer. They had a monstrously large factory. They were underutilizing the second shift. We made a deal together. They provided the equipment, the, the, the people. I had to bring the tool and dies. Those are the metal that for, forms and, and, and um, molds the various parts that go into the assemblies that combine to make a various product. He said that I had to, they had offices in 10 different countries. They had sales teams in 10 different countries. They had thousands of dealers in 10 different countries. I had to go and teach the salespeople how to uh, recruit the dealers because even though they were lawnmower dealers, they weren't motorcycle. I had to teach the dealers how to display and sell the motorcycles. And he said, all that notwithstanding, with almost no money in the first 15 months, each of us made $20 million profit of peach piece from this relationship. I can go on and on, but it, that's sort of the essence. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great profit. And maybe sometimes getting a, a business loan isn't the best thing because it makes you a little bit lazy. And this way you have to work harder for it. So now, uh, could you give maybe three main ways for a business to maximize profit while reducing expenses in our crazy times? Yeah, sure. I'll go back to my fundamentals. I've, I'm known for a couple of different things. One is the three ways to grow a business. Most people don't really focus on it. They focus mostly, I'm not going to get deep because I could do hours on this. <clears throat> we do get into it pretty deeply in the book though. Uh, most people spend all their time and effort trying to get buyers, initial buyers. What they don't spend much of any time is, is getting those buyers to ethically spend more each time they purchase. So they'll make a lot more profit per sale. What they very rarely do is spend more time trying to get them to buy more often or more things, which costs nothing because you've got a sunk cost and acquire them. What they don't spend time doing is figuring other things they could introduce, almost the reverse of what we just said when they've got nothing else to sell. What they don't do is try to figure out uh, different sources of revenue. Uh, we have the three ways to grow a business, which is Increase the number of buyers. We have about 20 different ways to do it. And I think we list most of them in the book. The next is increase the size of the sale and thus the profit that transaction produces. Sometimes you could increase uh, the size of the sale through combinations of other products, larger units, adding a uh, service contract, any of a number of things, and you could double redouble the profitability of that sale. I'm sure we talk about that in the book. The last is get them to buy more often or get more utility value. Utility value means when you have nothing else to sell them. There are three advanced ways, Sheila. The first way is you penetrate a new a market or niche every year. Uh, the second is you introduce a new product or service every year. And the third is a variation of this book. You acquire a business, a product, a service uh, every year. Uh, the other next way would be what's called the power Parthenon. It's predicated on the assumption that most businesses generate almost or, or all of their business from one source, one approach, one method. Whereas if you added seven or eight other uh, com uh, complementary methods, you could double, redouble, redouble the number of buyers you could bring in the front door. You could double, redouble the, the stature you could give your business. 
Uh, the third way is called, uh, I call it the nine drivers of exponential growth. It's, it's small shifts in nine different things you do, factors of your business that can produce a monumental, almost unimaginable geometric increase each one. You change your strategy or go from tactical to strategic, you change your results. You change your marketing, you change your results. You change your business model, you change your results. You change your distribution channels, you change your results. You change how you use relationships, you change your results. You change your use of of uh, processes, systems, procedure, you change your results. You change, I can't remember all the changes, there's a couple more, and then you change your ideology, your belief system about whether this kind of a philosophy that I'm sharing is a better one than the philosophy you've been running. You change your results. There's three. And that, and that, that is great. That I think it was more than three. <laughs> yes. Now, how can preeminence help to create multiple streams of business of income for a business? Yeah, well, uh, preeminence is a concept that I, I mean, the strategy preeminence, preeminence has existed long before I was probably on this earth. But understanding its existence and embracing it and integrating it and imbuing your business with that kind of a attribute is very different. We did a ton of work and I introduced a philosophy many years ago called the strategy of preeminence. Again, it takes quite a long time to explain, but we summarize it in the book. And it's about elevating your business, your product, your service, your people, your status in the market's mind, the mind of the market, to the position of being seen as the only viable choice, the most trusted advisor or, or source they could choose for life. And understanding how to communicate that in ways that bond you to an audience above and beyond the maddening crowd of competitors. There are a lot of facets to it but it's a really cool process most uh, and it starts actually by referring to the people you sell to as clients not customers even if you're not a professional if you're not a <clears throat> service company because really and truly if you look at the definition webster definition of customer it's somebody who buys a commodity or a service if i call you a customer what i'm saying to you in essence is that I have nothing distinctive, unique, advantageous to offer. I am lucky as heck you would give me any business because I have nothing unique to offer. I'm a commodity. I'm a marginalized, generic entity. A client, on the other hand, if you look up the definition, is somebody who's under the care, the protection, or the well-being of another. It's got more of a fiduciary bet to it, so it's much different. So, yeah, I mean, all this integrates together because if you're going to buy a business and the business doesn't have that distinction, when you give it that distinction, I have studied it. The companies who are preeminent have, uh, uh, they, they not only outperform the ones that aren't by sometimes three to four times, their stock price is higher, their profit levels are higher their average metrics, they get more buyers, buy more time, spend more money, tell more people, get more referrals. So it has a cascading positive impact that is almost unimaginable. Yes. Now, one of the things that I noticed in the book was uh, when you're doing the deals and you're looking into businesses, many times a small, even mid-sized business owner hardly pays themselves a salary. So when they're taken out of the business, there has to be that amount of money that they should have been paying themselves that goes to somebody that's going to manage the business. What would you advise or suggest for people that are small business owners? Should they pay themselves? How should they pay themselves? What, what kind of a rule should they um, base their business on in order to have profit, but still be able to give themselves the pay that they would expect to receive anywhere else? Well, I mean, the assumption, I mean, why do you want to grow? Why do you want more prosperity? Why do you want wealth creation? Well, you know, there's a finite number of people that are driven just for nobility. They want to give all the money to charity or 
or you know the library or the hospital or to fight uh you know uh uh some of the atrocities you know uh, uh all kinds of things going on in our world but the majority of people want it because they are dissatisfied with what they are able to earn or what their entity or their career is is uh is paying them or delivering to them or generating for them so i think the first thing rather than telling you what to do it's asking what do you want and why i mean if you're making uh you know seventy five thousand dollars and you want 500 then it's not i mean plenty of people make a lot more than that it's it's having the ability to engineer what to reverse engineer whatever you want I mean, it, when you do this right, you acquire businesses and then you dramatically increase their ability to throw off profit. When you do it right, doing that allows you to compensate very fairly someone to run the business so that you can operate, as you said, above that. But you also should be able to generate as much, if not more, from that kind of a strategy than you're making doing it yourself. And if you think about it, every new acquisition properly um, uh, multiplied on the profit side should be able to throw off that income again and again. So if you're making, okay, a hundred grand from your single business and you acquire the next one, and that's got great upside potential, meaning great uh, profit boosting, so then you should be able to extricate yourself from day to day in your normal business, make enough on the increased profit you produce from uh, the newly acquired business that you're replacing yourself and then do it over and over again. But there is one very interesting shortcut to all this. And that is if you got this book and you went through it very carefully, even though it's advocating a, an acquisition, boost profit, and then exit strategy. In the middle of the book, there's three parts. First part is targeting, acquiring, funding your acquisition. Second part is how to really multiply profit performance. Third part is how to get an epic exit and a mammoth payday. If you never acquired a single business, if you never even tried to sell your business, which makes no sense if you could create an asset that could generate great wealth, if you only use the middle part, the section two, which has got uh, all these methods for multiplying profit performance without increasing investment or risk, and you just use them for your own business, or if you insisted on starting your own business instead of acquiring for that business, it would dramatically multiply your success probability, your income generation. So there's lots of different facets, this book and the mindset and the methodology and the strategy it extols would seem to uh, make possible. Yes. Now, I, I feel like when I went into business, I was in business to make money for my family. And, um, and the, the ultimate goal was freedom. And then 17 years of working 10, 12, 14 hours a day <laughs> before I got out. So th that freedom or that end goal, sometimes we lose sight of that, um, especially in business. And um, so could you explain a little bit about the exit strategy, the three to five years, how that works when you sell? I mean, coming from real estate, I'm understanding it's a different term, but it's like you get... 10 years worth of the income of the business when you sell um, kind of like a cap rate, but there's a different term for that. So um, could you explain how you would actually profit from this? I feel like when I became an investor, that was so much easier and more profitable than running that business day to day. Uh, yeah, I'll just do it in lay terms. So you start with, let's say you have no business. You start by acquiring a business. You acquire it at a very low multiple because you're not acquiring the top performing business. It's profitable or it's at least breaking even. 
you're not buying it with much or any of your own capital. So your investment is very low. You make that business produce a lot more profit. Okay. Businesses are sold on, uh, on a multiple of profit or a multiple of revenue. And it certain, as I said earlier, at a certain size increase, the multiple increases almost exponentially. A, a million dollar business is worth a lot lower multiple than a hundred million dollar business. So a $5 million business that you would expand and create is worth a lot more, not just in, in profit, but in the multiple people will pay for that profit because it's got more substance, more, uh, more meaning. Because a lot of people buying businesses are buying it because they need it to make a certain income. If you're only making $100,000, that only appeals to a certain kind of person or company. If you're making a million dollars, that appeals to a much different company and it's worth a lot more to them. So when you buy something or many somethings, you're buying it at a lower uh, multiple, a lower markup, a lower value than it should be worth when you combine it and also boost the profit. So if you start with your own business and it's making 100,000 and you acquired five businesses and each of those were making 100,000, but you got all five of those to triple profits so that theoretically now we're at not uh, 500,000 more, but a million and a half more, but you also did it to your 100,000. So now it's a million seven a business making a million seven is worth a much higher multiple than a business making a hundred thousand dollars. So if you tried to sell your hundred thousand dollar business today, maybe you would get $200,000 for it. And because it wouldn't be that desirable of a sale, you might not even get it all up front. You might get a third now and have to wait over two or three years to get a third, a third again. But if you had a, a business making two or three million dollars, you would get most all your money up front, if not all, and you would get a multiple that would be many times more. So if in three years you can start with this hypothetical hundred thousand dollar business profit, and you could end up with a million dollar profit or a million and a half dollar profit in three years and you sell what you would have had maybe $200,000 worth of, of, uh, of, uh, of capital of, of, of say sales proceeds from with the original business. Now you might be getting $5 million, 5 million compared to that hypothetical 2 million is uh, what is 2 million. It was five was yeah. Five, million compared to 200,000, excuse me, 200,000 is two, is it 20 times, 20, 25 times more. So you would have to work 25 years at the same level as your basic business to get the same amount you would get in three years. Does that make sense or is it too confusing? That totally makes sense. And, it, and Sheila, I have a timeline. I have to wrap it up very quickly. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. No, no problem. So yes, definitely that makes sense. And there is so much information in the book and there is a wonderful event that you are offering. Everybody who's listening in, there is a bonus. If uh, Jay, if you could share about well, the event. Sure, I will. On, uh, and it's, it's fast uh, um, uh, occurring. It's, it's, it's on Saturday, this coming Saturday week. Well, we're doing this today, which is Saturday, a week from this Saturday when we're doing this, the 23rd at, I think it's 11 o'clock California time, PSD. We're doing a 90 minute launch of the official launch of the book live. You can register for it. Uh, Roland Frazier, my colleague and I will explain this more detailed. He's a little uh, or a lot better at the acquisition and the exit explanation than I am. I'm trying to give you the big brush strokes. And we're going to tell you all about it. And we're going to make a, a, 
very uh, advantageous offer if you wish to buy one or many copies of the book. But more importantly, we're going to um, um, ethically, but uh, uh, remarkably induce you to want to do that because we're going to offer you literally thousands of dollars of incentives to get you to buy the book. And uh, our motives are very straightforward. We need to get a lot of people to buy the book and apply uh, the, the methodology. We need to get a lot of people to buy the book, get rock their boat and tell a lot of people who have larger businesses, we are looking for deal flow. Deal flow is a small number of these people, but we want to enrich and, and inspire anybody who has been pursuing, which is almost everybody, the slowest, hardest, most low yielding path to security, prosperity, or wealth creation to take a moment and rethink the rest of their business life or their career. Anybody who's wanting to start a business from scratch to rethink it. Everybody who's been consent or feels that they have no options but to keep playing out their current business until it either peters out or they can sell it for something or they can retire to rethink it. We want to rethink. We want to help everybody rethink the rest of their life. So uh, September the 23rd, I think you have the link people can register. And I would encourage as many people as possible to want to be there. I think it'll be uh, stimulating and refreshing and very uh, profit provoking for anybody and wealth um, uh, shifting for everybody. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. I really appreciate you uh, sharing about your new book. And for those tuning in, I definitely will be sharing the link on all the channels and the show notes. Thank you again, again Jay. Do you have any last um, comments? Uh, this way of thinking and doing and being has the capacity to uh, to unimaginably transform uh, the quality of your life, the security of your life, the richness of your life, the happiness of your life, the freedom that it gives you, the options you can pursue, the things you can experience, the people you can help. Uh, I just hope that you'll at least evaluate it objectively. I think if you read the book, uh, it's a fabulous and very, very um, thought, not just provoking, but but paradigm shifting read. And I hope that uh, we'll see you on the 23rd at 11 o'clock uh, PST. Thanks, Sheila.